All right. Thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, my name is Jimmy Weebler. I am a naturalist and research coordinator here at Nahant Marsh. Um, normally, I lead bird hikes here at Nahant. Um, we usually do those um, typically on the fourth Saturday of every month, although that may get that schedule may get changed uh, this year. But um, for folks that are interested in birding in general or just like being outside and hiking, uh, we do offer bird hikes here um, at least once a month. And so um, I normally lead those, not always, but um, at least during these cold winter months, we thought it would be fun to, when the bird, birding weather isn't so great, we thought we would offer some, um, some presentations, some webinars on how folks can increase their skills as a birder. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about sparrows, tanagers, gross beaks, and buntings, and similar species of Iowa. And so all the species you're going to see here today are uh, species that you can find here in the Quad Cities area. And um, I included most of the common ones and some uncommon ones. I, I did not include some of the rare ones that are more difficult to find, but this um, in general covers almost all of the these types of species that you would find in the Quad Cities area. So also another uh, quick note, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take questions at the end. And if you wouldn't mind just typing those into the chat box and I will open that chat box at the end here and try to get through some of those questions. So, um, by the way, there's some other names uh, written down here that you may have noticed. And so um, these this presentation in particular was put together by uh, Kelly McKay, who's a an avid birder, an expert birder really in the area, as well as Mark Roberts um, and Brian Ritter and myself um, created these presentations as part of the, an initiative called the Building Better Birders and Citizen Scientists Project. And so this was a, a grant funded initiative to, um, to build citizen scientists and get people um, more interested in birding and out there recording birds as, as far as surveys go. And it was funded through the REAP program, which is the Resource Enhancement and Protection uh, Program. So it's a program in the state of Iowa that invests in uh, the enhancement and protection of the state's natural and cultural resources. And so this is a really cool uh, project that I'm happy to be a part of. And um, that's why you see so many names here is because this is a project that wasn't just put on by myself, but by some of these other folks as well. And these are some of the sponsoring organizations for that initiative. And so also before we get started, I'll, you'll be seeing a map on each. Of, so we'll be covering different species and I'll show pictures of each of those species. And by each of those species photos, you know, you'll see a map. And this is the range map of those species. And in general, if you haven't seen a map like this before, um, in general, they're color coded so that purple usually represents a permanent resident. So you can find that species there year round. So whenever you see purple kind of in the eastern Iowa area, that means that that species that I'm talking about is going to be there year round. Um, uh, orange color is generally reserved for birds that are here only in the summer. Uh, yellow means migration to get those um, in migration only. And then the blue is a winter or non breeding resident of the state. And then when you see uh, <clears throat> South America included in there, Central America, that means it's a neotropical migrant. So when that is excluded, like here in the middle, that means it's um, just a migrant. So pay attention to that. You can see which of these species we talk about today are, are neotropical migrants. And I'll try to point that out as we go too. So the first species I want to talk about here is the American pipit. And in general, for each of these species I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about how to identify them. What are some some characters um, that you should look for when you're when you're trying to identify these species in the field. I'll talk about their song and I'll actually play their song for you. And then I'll talk about how to find this bird. So what kind of habitats do they um, do they prefer? And just some general uh, comments on where and how to find these species. Hopefully that's helpful. So um, the first one is a pipit here. This isn't a, a sparrow, it's called the American pipit. They're similar to sparrows, but they're more slender with a thinner bill. And I, th I think they kind of resemble robins in a way, um, but they have a certain behavior where they sort of walk delicately along the ground and with their head held high, kind of like a robin would. Um, so how do you find this bird? Look for these in open areas, especially sod fields. So there's a, a sod field in, in the Quad Cities called Seven City Sod, I believe. And that's a really good spot to look for this species. Um, but you can also look in open agricultural areas, especially during migration. Um, so we're, you're more likely to find this species during the fall, but um, 
but you can also find them during the, the mig or the spring migration season. And so I will play the call here. And hopefully folks can hear this. So I don't know if folks could give me a thumbs up in the chat if you could hear that well, if that was too loud or too quiet or just right, um, that some comments there might be helpful for me to adjust the, the sound um, going forward. I'm, I'm actually playing these on a cell phone through the, the speaker here. So hopefully um, you could hear that pretty well. But I, as far as our song goes, it's, it's a series of high clear phrases. I think it sounds, I think it sounds kind of like a car alarm a little bit. So um, I'll play that one more time. And I, someone said it sounded initially too loud and then it was too quiet. So hopefully. Someone said, turn it up. Hopefully that's good. Um, if not, if there's issues um, going forward with me playing these, these calls, uh, feel free to keep, keep uh, chiming in in the chat box there and I'll, I'll keep an eye on that and make sure I adjust accordingly. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with the Pippet is I'm showing two photos here. These are both adults, uh, but there are different color phases. <clears throat> or different subspecies of the American Pippet. And so we've got a paler adult, which is sort of more of a buffy kind of color there on the left, and then a non-breeding plumaged dark adult, uh, which you see on the right-hand side there. So two different plumages to watch out for. But again, you're looking for something that looks like a sparrow, but much more slender. I think they look similar to a robin. But again, you're gonna find these um, in certain habitats such as open fields and sod fields, um, but also listen for that call. That's gonna definitely, definitely help you out in identifying this one. And again, you're only going to find these during migration. So if you see what you think is a pipit in the summer or winter, probably not the right species. All right, the next one we're going to talk about is the Lapland longspur. And so um, this species is actually one of the most numerous, um, <clears throat> one of the most abundant breeding songbirds in North America. And it's sort of overlooked a lot. And the way you identify these, <clears throat> the breeding plumage is very easy to tell. Um, we've got a breeding male in the upper left there, although we don't normally see them like that in Iowa. And so we normally only see these um, during migration, um, but the best, most common months to see them is probably December and January. So they're much more common in the winter time. And <clears throat> we're not gonna see them looking like that one in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we're gonna see the non-breeding plumage in the winter time. It's gonna look like that bottom, bottom right hand photo. And so it looks like a sparrow, but they've got much shorter legs and they've got a long claw that's on one of their hind toes. And so that's how they get that name, Lapland long spur. And um, <clears throat> they also have white outer tail feathers is another key uh, character to identify in the field. Uh, but they've got a strongly patterned face, a yellow bill. Uh, the female has a dark chest band around it. And so where do you find these? Look for large flocks of them on uh, county roads, gravel roads, especially where you find those horned larks and snow buntings, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, you're going to find them out on gravel roads a lot out in the country. Um, that's where I typically see them myself. And um, you're going to find them definitely during migration in the winter. So I'll play the song. Or I'm not going to play the breeding song, but I can play what their call sounds like. Sort of a whistle. I don't really have a good way to remember that one. Um, some of the, some of the bird songs here, I'll, I'll give you a kind of uh, some tips and tricks on how to remember how their call. But uh, that one, I don't have a great a great thing to remember it. But um, sort of a unique whistle. And again, look for them in large flocks. These they don't generally hang out. Um, so they're not generally solitary. So if you see a big flock of birds on the gravel road, maybe take a um, maybe slow down or stop and uh, try to get a look at them with your binoculars. I've, from what I found, they're actually kind of skittish birds too. They don't let you get up close with your car. They'll actually flush from the gravel road. So you might have to um, use binoculars and stay far back to get a better look at these. But that's the Lapland Longspur. <clears throat> this is the snow bunting. So these are related to long spurs. Um, <clears throat> they're larger than most sparrows. 
but um, this here I'm showing a photo of them in their winter plumage. That's the only time we'll see them here in Iowa is in the winter. Um, <clears throat> again, we're going to find them on open grounds uh, such as fields, uh, agriculture fields. They're often mixed with horn larks and lapping long spears, so you can also find them on gravel roads, <clears throat> especially when there's a snow event. Um, in the wintertime, they're these, this pale cinnamon color, cinnamon and white. Um, they have these large white wing patches, which is unmistakable in the field. Uh, no other songbird really has that much white on them. So these aren't too hard to identify. It's just a matter of timing of year and location where you're going to find these. Um, so let me play their, their song here. That's the call you might hear in the field um, when they're, and they, these like the lap and long spurs tend to hang out in big flocks as well. So that's the snow bunting. So now we're moving into the sparrows. And so the first one here we're gonna talk about is the grasshopper sparrow. Um, these are very hard to find in the field. They're uncommon, but they're found in local, um, local areas and usually in large expanses of grass um, with tall grass, maybe scattered shrubs and weeds. This is kind of typical habitat of most sparrows, uh, but these sparrows in particular, they usually run rather than fly and they stay down on the grass. So they're, they're hard to, to actually see, but um, they are commonly heard. And so they, they have a unique call and they get their, their name grasshopper sparrow um, because they eat grasshoppers, but I think they also sound like an insect. So let me play their call. So that's really the best way to identify these, um, these sparrows is first hearing that, that song um, if you can remember what that sounds like, you'll, you'll start to hear these out in the country over large fields. Um, but the way you identify them is they have a, a really a, almost a comically large bill for how small this sparrow is. So a very large bill. They have an eye ring, that white eye ring around it. Um, they have a dark spot on the rear of their auriculars, which is basically near their ear. So this dark spot right here. Um, they have rufous spots on their back. So you can see these reddish colored spots along the back here. And then they have an unstreaked breast. And so that's also um, typical. If, if you're trying to identify a sparrow, one of the, the best ways to identify them is you've got to be, pay attention to detail, right? Because a lot of sparrows look similar. They're a lot, most of them are drab and brown. A lot of them have a lot of streaking, um, but sparrows are generally grouped into, into either streaked or non-streaked breast um, sparrows. And so um, by looking at the breast and seeing if it's streaked or not, that's going to rule out um, many of the other sparrows. Um, and you're trying to identify it. Uh, but the other thing is paying attention to its face. The face and the bill um, is going to be a good indicator of what species it is. And if you look, study them close enough and you look at, a, look at them enough, you, you'll be able to tell that each of them has a different sort of face depending on their bill shape and just how their face looks. And so I, when I'm looking at sparrows, I always try to see if I can tell if their, their breast is streaked or not. And that rules out, you know, half the species maybe. And then looking at their face is going to be able to help you out a lot there. So um, that's the grasshopper sparrow. I'll play its song one more time just for folks to listen again. All right, moving on. This is the lark sparrow. And the lark sparrow is a pretty easy to identify sparrow. I think it has this very variable or uh, not variable, but more harlequin face pattern, if you will. Um, they've got a white breast with a bold central spot. Um, there's another sparrow that has a, a spot there, but the other sparrow that we're gonna talk about that has a spot on its chest doesn't have the head pattern that this bird does. Um, but these also have white outer tail feathers. And so that's another good uh, clue in the field. Um, these are found from April to late July. And um, so they're much more common in the summertime. 
but you can start to see them in the, in the breeding or in the, the migration months. Um, you find them in grassy areas with scattered trees or short grass um, adjacent to hedgerows and trees. These also forage on the ground in short grass. Um, and so like most other sparrows, pretty similar habitat. I'll, and I'll play the song here. Um, they sort of have a, a bunch of jumbles of, of chirs and buzzes and play what that sounds like. So just a bunch of chirs, buzzes, and trills. And that's what the large sparrow sounds like. So pretty easy to identify, I think. All right, the next one is the chipping sparrow. This is an extremely common sparrow that we get in the quad cities here. And they start showing up in March, um, but they're extremely common all the way through from April all the way through August. And uh, the way to identify these is first by looking at the face and you see it has a bright red crown. Um, they have a black eye line is important to look at, uh, a white supercilium, which is this white line that goes above the eye. And they have a plain breast, so no streaking on the breast at all. And they have a characteristic song um, that you can identify them by. And you'll hear these everywhere if you remember this song. And it's sort of a simple, long, mechanical trill. I, for some reason, I always think it sounds like a machine gun. That's the best. Sort of like a playful machine gun, if you will. If there is such a thing. But that's, for some reason, that's how I remember it is it sounds like a, a machine gun. And so really long, uh, simple trill. Um, they, they're very common. Like I said, they start showing up in March. Uh, but you can find these pretty much anywhere in residential areas, urban areas, parks, neighborhoods, woodland edges. Pretty much find this bird anywhere. And um, we've got uh, a picture of the one here is a, a typical adult um, breeding. And then you've got the, the female there on the left or the right hand side. I think that is second here. Whoops. All right. So moving on to the clay colored sparrow. So this one, not nearly as common as the chipping sparrow, although they, they do look sort of similar. Um, the the clay colored sparrow kind of looks like a, a drab, uh, a drab chipping sparrow, if you will, but they're much paler and much more buffy overall. I'm gonna see if I can, my PowerPoint isn't letting me back, go back. Otherwise I would show the difference there. Um, but you can see, around the eye there, it's, it's much more buffy, kind of has a yellow tint to it. So the, uh, look for the, the buffy eye ring. And then they also have this gray collar that goes around the back of their neck. And that's helpful to identify. They have that at all times of the year. Um, so where do you find these? You find them during uh, migration months. Um, May is a really good month to find, find this species. Um, but they're found in similar habitat to other sparrows. Um, and they have their song is a series of sort of two to five rasping buzzes, uh, but they're all on one pitch. So I'll play what that sounds like. So just simple buzzes, either in twos or fives. Um, and that's the clay colored sparrow. So the next one is the field sparrow. This one is um, pretty e easy to identify, I think. Um, it has a, it has some rufous in the head, but mostly gray. Um, it has a complete white eye ring there and an entirely pink bill, uh, which is unique uh, to this one. And you're gonna find these in the summertime um, in weedy fields with scattered bushes and trees and the best way I think to identify or to find the field sparrow is to listen for its call. And to me, its call sounds like a ping pong ball bouncing off the end of a table. So sort of imagine a ping pong ball bouncing off the end of a table when you listen to this one.
So I think that's the best way to find these. You'll, you can hear that kind of all over the place out in the country fields, weedy fields, um, on the outskirts of town and that, um, just listen for that ping pong ball falling off the, the end of a table there. That's, um, that's a field sparrow. All right, the fox sparrow. The fox sparrow is um, the, one of the largest sparrows we have in Iowa. Large and stocky, overall reddish color. Um, at first glance, they sort of look similar to a song sparrow and they've got this gray and they've got these thick brown streaks on the breast. Uh, but the, the fox sparrow has much redder tinge to um, the, the streaks overall. And you find these um, in Iowa during the migration months. So even though this map shows them in, in um, at least in the Quasis area, kind of in the winter, we usually only find them during migration here. And they're found in small groups, kind of in brushy patches and thickets. And they're usually near woodlands in that those brushy thickets. And so I'll play their song here. They have sort of clear whistles, but they don't have any trills or rapid notes in their song. It's just mostly clear whistles. So I'll play what that sounds like. So again, big sparrow, roofish tinge overall, thick roofish streaks, um, some gray in the head, um, and that's that's the fox sparrow. Migration months only. So here is the American tree sparrow. This is the one I referred to earlier um, that has the black chest spot, and so that's a good field character to look for on this one. Um, also, another good character to look for if you see a bicolored bill, there's a good chance um, it's a tree sparrow, American tree sparrow. Uh, especially see that bicolored bill with that chest spot. It's most definitely an American tree sparrow. Uh, they also have a rufous crown, which is similar to the, the chipping sparrow, but they, they don't have a black eye line. They have more of a rufous tinged eye line. Uh, but with these, I always look for the bicolored bill and the chest spot. Um, where um, and when do you find these? American tree sparrows uh, show up during the winter time and in Iowa. <clears throat> and so you can find them, they're, they're most common November, December, January of, of the year in Iowa. And um, so they winter here, they're usually found in brushy or weedy habitat, just like many other sparrows, uh, but they do form large flocks. They're, they're not typically solitary. They're usually uh, with other American tree sparrows, um, but I'll play their call here. Um, they sort of have a soft, unique call um, and I don't have a good way to remember it, uh, but if you can memorize it, um, you, that's a little bit easier way to pick these out among other birds that they might be hanging out with. All right, so that's the American tree sparrow. Next one is the dark eyed junco. The dark-eyed junco is extremely common in Iowa. Um, and again, like the American tree sparrow, this one is found only in the winter time. And so it's, it's most common um, all the way from October really to April. Um, these birds are really common. And there's different subspecies of dark-eyed juncos. We have the slate colored here, and I've got a picture of the male and the female shown here. Um, but they're, they're overall dark birds. They've got a black or gray head. Uh, they've got a small pink bill and then white outer tail feathers. So these birds are kind of skittish. Um, they tend to hang out low in the brush and they're, they always fly away if you get near them. And so one of the best field characters, I think, for the dark-eyed junco is to look for a small bird that's flying away from you that has white outer tail feathers. And some other birds we've talked about today have had white outer tail feathers, but um, this is far more, I would rule this one out, you know, before you start to, um, I always roll out the junco first, I would say, if it has white outer tail feathers, especially if it's in the middle of winter and you see a dark small bird flying away kind of low in the brush. Um, and so um, they have a call that is similar to the chipping sparrow, the machine gun call that I played earlier, um, but it's a little bit more musical and not as dry as the chipping sparrow. So I'll play what that sounds like. playing some different varieties here. So 
So again, rapid, uh, rapid trill, um, but much more musical, I think, than the Chipping Sparrow. They also do some flight chips, and I'll play that here. Those flight chips, that's far more the much more common song that you'd hear or call that you'd hear these birds doing. I almost never hear them doing that, the song that I first played. Um, they could be doing that closer to the breeding season, but especially in the winter, they're normally doing those flight ships and jittets and things when they're, especially when they're uh, flying away from you. So that's a dark eyed junco. The next one is the white crown sparrow. And so this one is pretty easy, I think, to identify. Um, especially when it's a, a full-grown adult. Um, the winter first winter plumage is that they're a little bit drabber and can be confused with some other sparrows, but when they're in their formal plumage, their adult plumage, um, you can't really mistake them with anything else. They have that bright white crown with thick black streaks on their head. Um, they're relatively large sparrows, long-tailed, long neck, um, but they've got that extensive white on their crown and they've got this unmarked gray underside. So no streaking on the breast here. Um, find these, they're most common in May, but we can find them pretty much from September all the way through May. We don't really find them during the middle of the summer here in Iowa. Um, their song is uh, clear whistles followed by several buzzes. So I'll play that here. Whistles followed by buzzes. Uh, pretty and unique call to that. So um, if you can memorize that call, um, be more easily found, or this bird is a little bit e more easily found in the field when you listen for it by call. White crown sparrow. Uh, next is the white throated sparrow. And the white throated sparrow, um, as its name suggests, has a bright white throat. Um, and we've got two different varieties here. So the adults all look the same, but they range from this bright white to this sort of drab tan color. And regardless of the sex or age, they can be anywhere in between that. And so they're, they're really easy to identify when they're bright white like this. And they um, typically have yellow and what's called the lures, which is right between the bill and the eye here. And so I always look for that yellow when I'm looking at these birds in the field. Um, even the drab ones have a hint of yellow there. And so, uh, but they still have that white throat as well. And so like most other sparrows, um, find them in brushy patches or understory near mixed woods, um, especially find this one during migration. It's extremely common during migration months, April, May, October, um, but you can find them pretty much all the way through migration in the winter months, not really found during summertime. Um, we'll play what their, their song sounds like. And, um, some people describe it as them saying, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, or old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. So listen to that um, when you hear their call. So that's their song. And they also have a characteristic call. This is actually an alarm call. It doesn't quite sound like what they're, I don't actually know if I have a recording of their call, um, but they do have a characteristic call. So if you um, find these birds in the field, sort of listen to what, what calls they're making. And they sort of have a unique uh, kind of seat call, I think. And um, if you can memorize that, you, you can pick these birds out uh, without even seeing them because it's so unique. All right, next one is the Vesper Sparrow. And so this is a, um, a gray brown sort of streaky sparrow. And they're very similar to what we're gonna look at next to the Savannah sparrow, but these, the Vesper sparrow is larger than the Savannah and has a longer tail. Um, has, it also has white outer tail feathers. So see the arrow down here on the left hand picture. 
Um, so the white outer tail feathers is a really good key character on these. Um, they don't look anything like the Junko, so you won't confuse them with those. Um, but if you see a streaky sparrow with white outer tail feathers, check and see if you're looking at a Vesper. They've got a complete white eye ring. And um, unlike the Savannah, which we'll look at next, has a clean white belly. Usually these are kind of a buffy yellowy color underneath, although that can be a poor field color because these sparrows, so the one from the left compared to the right, they, they can wear down their feathers. And so the one on the right-hand side is what's called a worn adult. And when they do wear down their feathers, then they start to see this rufous patch on their shoulder, but that's almost never visible in the field unless it's a worn adult. Um, so you can see it's kind of, kind of hidden here on the left-hand picture. So I think the best way to figure, um, to identify the Vesper sparrow is to look for a streaky sparrow um, with those white outer tail feathers. And that white eye ring is, is pretty key character to it as well. And so also timing of year is important. So we're only going to see these during the summer and on the, the fringe of migration. So April to October, really. Um, and you're going to find these in grasslands, short grass, prairies, um, sort of similar to other, other sparrow habitat. Um, you can also, this one, uh, listen for the call is another good way to identify it. So it's, it begins with a, some paired whistles and then has these slow musical trills. So I, I think it kind of sounds like the beginning of a field sparrow call. Field sparrow was the one, if you remember, with the ping pong ball falling off the table. So I think it begins like that, but then it ends somewhat like a song sparrow. So almost starting out like that ping pong ball, but then it ch changes over to more of a song sparrow-y kind of call where a bunch of jumbles, musical jumbles there. So that's the Vesper. And this is the Savannah. So similar to a song sparrow, similar to that Vesper sparrow, really similar to a song sparrow, which we'll look at soon. But um, they have yellow, generally, usually they have this yellow um, in the face and that comes over the eye and they've got this sort of yellow eye ring. Um, so I always, whenever I see a sparrow that looks like a song sparrow, I always try to rule out song sparrow. Song sparrow is the far more common one. Um, but um, if you find something that looks like a song sparrow that has a lot of yellow in the face, there's a good chance you're looking at a Savannah sparrow. And so um, these are found in Iowa during the summer. And pretty much you can find them during migration too, any from April all the way through November, um, but most likely to see them during the, the summer. Um, again, similar habitat to other sparrows in grassy, weedy habitats, marshes and fields. Um, and they have a unique call. Um, they sort of sound similar to a grasshopper sparrow, uh, but they have several different pitches. And so it's a series of buzzes and we'll play what that sounds like. I think it sounds similar to a song sparrow, but much more insect-like, um, similar to that grasshopper sparrow that we heard earlier. That's the savanna. So now we get to the song sparrow, a uh, very common sparrow in Iowa, found any time of the year, um, most common from May through October, but can be found any time of the year. Uh, we do find them in the winter here. Um, song sparrow is a, a coarsely streaked sparrow, so streaking on the breast here, and the streaks kind of all converge into this messy chest spot here in the middle, um, and they sort of have a grayish face with some brown striping, um, but these are common and widespread. You find them in Iowa throughout the year. Um, it's probably the most frequently seen streak sparrow that we have in Iowa, and they ha do have a characteristic call um, that's a series of trills and clear notes. And usually the, the trill in the middle is the longest trill of the call. So that's the song sparrow call. Um, these are found throughout 
throughout the United States. And I would point out that song sparrows have different dialects. Uh, I don't know if people realize that birds can, even if it's the same species, can sound different depending on where you're at in the United States. And so song sparrows are kind of notorious for that and that they, they sort of have a similar song, but that dialect can sound, the accent, if you will, will sound different depending on the where that bird is at in the United States. Uh, but that's what I played here is pretty similar to what they sound like in Iowa. All right, the next one is the Lincoln Sparrow very similar to a song sparrow, but notice the very fine streaks on the breast. And so um, the streaking can look very similar to the song sparrow, but just not nearly as thick of streaks. They almost look like they've been etched on there. Uh, so very fine streaking, but otherwise generally looks similar to the song sparrow and that they've got this gray in the head. They've got these brown stripes, uh, sort of grayish bill, um, overall drab brown. Um, but these are only found during migration months. So April, May, September, October is the most common months you'll see this sparrow. So if you think you're seeing a Lincoln's, um, that's probably not, you probably won't see them outside of those months. So pay attention to the month of the year when you're trying to identify these. Um, they have, I'll play the song here. They kind of have a jumble of different chirping trills and several different pitch changes within there. They, they kind of sound, sound reminiscent of a house sparrow, if you know what those sound like, but I'll play their song here. All right, that is the Lincoln Sparrow. All right, the next one up and the second to last sparrow here is the swamp sparrow. So swamp sparrows, um, pretty easy to identify, I think. They have a, sort of a gray, a grayish head. Um, they're small and dark. They've got a dark bill, but they've got this rufous crown on top. Um, they've got rufous in the wings here, especially the, uh, the wing bars or the wing coverts, sorry, these, these upper shoulder area um, is, is rufous and they've got a gray neck which is also characteristic. Um, they're found in Iowa during pretty, you can find them really any time of the year, but migration and summer is the most common time to find them. And they have a musical trill for their song that sounds similar to the chipping sparrow. Again, the chipping sparrow is the machine gun kind of call, um, but much, much more musical and less machine gunny, if that's an adjective. <laughs> So I just got a comment said someone said the last two songs have been faint. So hopefully play this one more time. So if, if you're taking notes and if you remember, um, I guess I'll just repoint out, I guess the, the three birds that sort of have that similar trill call is the, the chipping sparrow, the dark eyed junco, and the swamp sparrow here all have that similar trill um, with different pitches and kind of the chipping sparrow is probably the most dry of that. The swamp sparrow is much more musical, I think. So if you're if you're going back and want to play these or find the calls online, um, I think the, the three to compare would be the chipping sparrow, the swamp sparrow, and the dark eyed junco. Uh, the next, uh, I think this is the last sparrow we'll talk about is the tohi. And this is the Eastern Tohi. Um, <clears throat> they are really easy to identify. They have this black hood. The males are pretty, um, pretty remarkable. The black hood and uh, the female is similar, a uh, little bit more drab than the, the male, uh, but they've got white patches at the base of the primary. So the primary uh, feathers here, the flight feathers, they've got this, these white patches at the in there. You can see it here on the female. Um, so that's a good field mark, but you can't really mess these up, I don't think, in the field. Um, they are secretive. They're, they're common, but they're usually found in brushy habitats, but they're secretive and usually solitary. So you only use, really see them on the ground foraging, and they, they tend to hide pretty well in the in woodlands. Uh, but they have a really characteristic call that 
the way to remember it is they say, drink your tea, drink your tea. So listen for that when I play the call. Drink your tea. And they also do a characteristic call um, that sounds like this. So pretty easy to identify calls, I think, in the field. All right, moving on now from sparrows and similar species. And the next seven birds we're going to look at will be the last of the birds. But the next seven we're going to look at are all members of the cardinal family, cardinalidae. And so the first one we'll look at is the summer tanager. Um, and so these birds are really easy to identify. Um, not too many birds are all red all over. Um, you can't really confuse them with a cardinal either because the cardinals have you know a reddish orange bill, a triangle shaped bill. Tanagers have a unique shaped bill. So if you can remember that like this is where I was talking about earlier, it's important to kind of remember the face of birds. And um, if you look at tanagers enough, kind of study them, they, they have a, a unique face, I think, and a unique bill shape. Um, so we've got the male on the left here, all red, and the female on the right hand side, sort of an orangey yellow. And um, they could be confused maybe at first glance with a warbler or something in, in the migration months. But again, that, that bill is a dead giveaway for the tanager. And so, um, Really only find these in May, May and May and July are probably the best two months to find the summer tanager. Um, but the the call is a series of phrases that, that sound very robin like. And so see if you agree. Almost like a robin with a sore throat. And so they also have a call that they do that's very characteristic of this bird. So that's what their call sounds like. And they do that all the time. Um, sometimes they only do a simple pit tuck but a lot of times they'll do that uh, picky tucky tuck, um, which is that call that I just played. Picky tucky tuck. So that's the summer tanager. So we'll compare that with the scarlet tanager. Um, scarlet tanager is sort of similar, but has um, all black wings on an all red bird uh, for the male and the yellowy orange uh, female also has those black wings. So I don't think they're easily confused. Um, but again, they still have that same tanager shaped beak. And so the scarlet tanager found in similar, similar habitat to the summer tanager. So the summer tanager and scarlet tanager are both found during migration months. Um, the scarlet tanager is more, you can see them during the summer too. Um, but both of them, I forgot to mention for the summer tanager as well, both these birds are usually found in the tops of trees. So they're, they're kind of hard to find um, with the naked eye. They, they tend to hang out at the tops of trees, but they're uh, both of these species are found in deciduous forests. Um, so this one also sounds like a robin, I think, with a sore throat. So we'll play that. So I think scarlets and summers both kind of sound like robins with a sore throat, but um, whereas the summer tanager had the picky tucky tuck call, the scarlet tanager says chick burr, chick burr, usually interspersed with that song. So listen for the chick burr when you're out in the field. Chick burr. So that's the scarlet tanager. Uh, the next one is the northern cardinal. Um, hopefully everyone has seen a northern cardinal before, um, but we'll point it out here anyways. Got the male on the left and the female on the right-hand side. Where do you find this one? Pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Uh, found at all times of the year in Iowa. Um, and we'll play the call here.
they sort of sound like laser guns to me. especially the end of the call there sort of sounds like a laser gun. A lot of people describe them as, and then they have a call um, that's sort of a hard tick call. And so they, they do that all the time and they're probably, a lot of people miss them if you if you don't listen for that. Um, but if they do have a characteristic uh, call, that tick, hard tick call is something they do constantly in the field. Um, so listen for that when you're, especially during the winter months, uh, listen for that when you're looking for cardinals. All right, a couple of rose breed, or a couple of gross beaks, sorry, that we're going to talk about. The rose breasted gross beak is the first one. Um, this is a, the, the really unmistakable, especially the male, um, the, the male rose-breasted grosbeak beak is black, white, and red. They've got that rosy red um, chest or breast where they get their name. The female can be confused with other sparrows, I think. Um, and they can also be confused with purple finches. Female purple finches look similar. Uh, but the big bill, the big gross beak um, is a dead giveaway for these. So big honking bill on these. Uh, the female look for that white supercilium, that white eye line um, and streaking on the breasts. Um, but the rose-breasted gross beak, I think, is pretty pretty easy to identify. Um, they're common in deciduous forests, usually um, like the tanagers found in the upper levels of trees. But they're also a feeder bird, so you, if you you know put out bird seed, you can attract them to your feeder. Um, they're common in the summertime, but they're found pretty much April to October. Um, these also sound like robins a little bit, um, but they've got sort of a they always um, it's it's more of a warble than than a robin call, I think. So we'll play that. Very warbly. And then they always they almost always throw in these metallic chink calls with that song. A lot of people describe that as squeaky sneakers on a, on a gym floor. And so they, they throw that call in often with their song. Um, so listen to that in the field. The next gross beak is the blue gross beak. These aren't nearly as common as the rose-breasted gross beaks. Um, but we do have them here in Iowa, and I think they're becoming more numerous than previous years. Um, I've seen them the last several summers, um, and we, they are typically only found in the summer here, um, especially July, um, June, July. And blue gross beaks are, um, I guess the only bird you might confuse them with is an indigo bunting, the male, kind of all blue. Uh, but the indigo buntings don't have these brown wing bars uh, that the blue gross beak does, and the beak is way different between an indigo bunting and a, and a gross beak. Gross beaks have much bigger bills. The female looks identical to the male. It's just all brown, but it's got that big, big, uh, big beak. It doesn't have the streaking like the rose-breasted gross beak. It's pretty much all brown. Um, but these are found from May, um, May through August, really. But like I said, they're most common in June and July, um, and they're found in weedy fields, um, brushy patches, hedgerows. Um, they tend to like sandy areas as well. Um, big sand mound is a good place to find them. Um, I think we, we've seen them at Nahant Marsh before. We have a small sand prairie here. Um, so they, they seem to like sandy areas with sandy soils. Um, and we'll play their call here for you. And they also do a metallic sort of chink call. Disregard the coots there in the background. Um, so that's the, the blue gross beak. And then the indigo bunting, 
Um, I think we've got last two birds here, indigo bunting, um, brilliant blue male. Can't really, don't really think you could confuse that with another one, maybe the blue gross beak, but again, um, the bill is way different, not nearly as big as the blue gross beak, and it doesn't have the rufous or brown wing bars. Uh, the males are all blue. The female can be confused uh, maybe with some sparrows, but it kind of has a bicolored bill, much darker on the top. So if you can try to find that in the field, bicolored bill. Um, and a lot of times though, they'll have hints of blue, um, maybe in the tail or in the wings. So look for that. Also, they have different habits and calls than sparrows. Uh, but indigo buntings, you can find them anywhere. Um, the best way to find them first, I think, is by listening for their call. And the way you remember their call is they sing in series of twos. And the best way to remember it, I think, um, is they say, fire, fire, where, where, here, here, see it, see it, put it out, put it out. And so if you listen for that, when you listen to the call. So not the best recording, but they, they sing in twos. And if, if you hear them enough, you'll, you'll start to hear that fire, fire, where, where, here, here, singing in twos. And so I think that's the best way to identify them. Indigo bunting. Uh, the next one is the dick sissel. And so uh, the dick sissel is also a member of the cardinal family. And um, I don't think they can be confused with much, many other species. Um, the size and the shape of them is sort of similar to a house sparrow. And notice I didn't, by the way, I didn't mention um, house sparrow as a species throughout this presentation. And that's a lot of people don't realize that house sparrows are actually not sparrows. They're old world weaver finches, uh, but that's just sort of an aside note. Uh, but these are similar to a house sparrow size, uh, but they're much sleeker. They've got a longer bill. Um, the male has this black chest band and they've got a yellow breast and uh, brown on the wings. These are common in grassy or weedy fields, uh, tall grass prairies with scattered shrubs, trees, hedgerows, sort of similar to other sparrow habitat that we talked about. Um, and they have a characteristic song uh, where they sort of say their name in the song. If you remember that, you'll hear these guys everywhere um, out in the countrysides. Um, but again, this is the dick sissel. So male on the left, female on the right. All right, so that pretty much covers all the sparrows, gross beaks, and tanagers and similar species. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to chime in in the chat and I'd be happy to answer those. If not, thanks for joining me and um, stay tuned for another webinar. We'll be doing another one of these next month. And then uh, also stay tuned for more bird hikes uh, coming up in March. So if you follow us on Facebook, um, we post all of our events on Facebook um, and other social media accounts, but we also post, um, if you're not on our mailing list, uh, feel free to get on our mailing list. Um, you can also check us out at nehantmarsh.org uh, where we post all of our events on there. Thanks everyone. Seeing a lot of thank yous coming through. Thanks. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for joining me. Glad you enjoyed it.